is the Aqua Sensory Podcast. I'm your host, Jo Wilson. In this show, you will learn all about sensory harmony in water for babies and the early years. Because when we grow to love, connect and respect water, learning follows naturally. Oh, thank you so much for joining me today, Greer. We're going to have a little bit of a chat about your amazing background and book as well. I've really, really enjoyed reading it, The Nurture Revolution. And it's so important for parents to know the, all of these brain science and facts and to really empower. So I think there's a little bit of a blind spot sometimes and sometimes quite confusing information. So do let our listeners know how your book came about. I've loved reading it. Yeah, thank you so much. I, you know, my life, my childhood experiences, my baby experiences, sort of led me into a lot of curiosity about how does the mind work? How does the brain work? I was always really interested in people's experiences and especially in that early baby time. So that kind of led me to to study neuroscience for many years. I did an undergraduate degree in neuroscience, a PhD in medical science and neuroscience, and also a postdoctoral fellowship I was a research assistant studying neuroscience and really focusing on how does mental health Mm. sort of function in the brain? Like what are the underlying brain circuits that contribute to mental health and mental, you know, wellness and struggles. And that really led me to early life experience. Mm. It's really interesting that over, you know, over the, the time that I was studying, which was about 15 or 20 years studying and, you know, directly forming research experiments and designing them and carrying them out and writing them up. This field that I call nurture neuroscience Mm -hmm. uh, came out. And so, you know, throughout my whole career, this was like really something I was so interested in and it just blossomed over these 20 years or so. It started in the nineties with Michael Meany's work at McGill and Moshe Ziff and then and then just continued on in so many different labs at least to get my attention people have been working on it for a long time but these really definitive things were coming out and I really always wanted to apply neuroscience it's, I, I know that everyone's so fascinated with it and it has so many gifts to give us and it just became overwhelming that for me that I needed to get this the information out to families and parents so I decided to turn my career into a doula after yeah. after my postdoc at Columbia University and to write the book I was like I'm gonna leave this lab and write this book and that will be that but now it's about eight years later what? maybe even a little more and maybe 10 years later. And now the book has all of that research, plus all the new stuff and all my experience working with families and my experience as a mother myself. So that's kind of, yeah, that's how it came about. And I'm just thrilled that it's all together in one place now. Yeah, no, I love it. What you do is you make actually quite complicated neuroscience into really easy reads and with lots and lots of facts as well. And I love the little drawings as well I can really resonate with those because I think it's nice that there's such a crossover I am a big advocate of really empowering parents to understand infant mental health because the first 1001 days are just so important but I just love the simplicity of how you really help parents and and they just understand what shapes their 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 baby's brains Mm -hmm. yeah I think I wanted to make it really clear because when I was working with families, I was always going back to those brain areas. I was like, we're building these foundational brain areas. And I know this is, this needs to be our focus, right? Our, our, you know, I call our North star, nurture North star, like everything we're doing with our babies, we need to be thinking about, you know, giving these brain areas their, their greatest chance to grow into, you know, thriving thriving brain circuits yeah definitely and for anybody that is listening that isn't quite sure or thought oh you know I sort of know about mental health but infant mental health what is that and why is it important what do you how do you do do you explain it to parents in a sort of like a little bit of a sort of like a nutshell yeah absolutely I think the first time I heard that term infant mental health like stood up and cheered yeah (laughs) yeah 
<laughs> there's a name for it. And, and, you know, I think the important thing for parents to understand is the infant brain is so flexible in these first three years of life. It's forming 1 million connections every single second. It's unbelievable. Like 84 billion connections a day, mind blowing stuff, right? The brain is one of the most, I mean, is the most complex thing, you know, on earth, right? Yeah. That we know in existence. And so, so because it's forming so rapidly, we really do need to pay attention to these emotional brain circuits that are being formed because in these early years, the experience the babies have mm-hmm. dramatically shapes, you know, every part of mental health that we know of right now in the brain, the correlates in the brain. So the stress system, neurotransmitter systems, often people are familiar with how neurotransmitter systems might influence mental health because of a lot of the pharmaceuticals that we have available, Mm -hmm. serotonin, dopamine, things like that. And, and yeah, and, and even our gut health too, right? So, so every part of our brain that's going to, you know, contribute to our mental health for our whole life is significantly formed in those first three years of life Mm, yeah because you know we know that the early years matter but as you say maybe not as much of thinking well it's just the here and now of those first three years but as you say it's the foundation the brain architecture that's actually going to affect the whole of their life you know academic success how we form relationships and uh, yeah I was looking into a research study recently and there was it was it was done by Maury Paul I think it was it was for the big five questions for parents and it came out that 25 percent of parents knew about the first few years of life but 75 percent actually didn't realize how important it was impacting the rest of their lives so you know, yeah. I do feel there is a little bit of a, a blind spot of what we can be doing as parents and educators, because sometimes it's complicated, isn't it? There's so much information out there. You know, we're, we're sort of drawn in maybe the practical, but not so much the emotional. And yeah. it doesn't always have to be that complicated. There can be really simple things, isn't there? That, that It I really think. is. Yeah, I think that, you know, there is, because I think many people are either aware or sort of even unconsciously we'll hear that these early years are so important. Yeah. It can create so without the education can create so much anxiety for parents mm-hmm. where they're sort of overthinking every decision, every move, you know, everything they do, even doing things that are sort of against their intuition yeah. because other people are saying, Oh, that's the best thing for these early years. And these early years matter. Right. So there's a lot of confusion a lot of mis-edu- like miseducation around it. And I think when parents can be grounded in the facts, so much of this anxiety and worry goes away. So much more joy in parenting and, and, and you know, really being there with our babies can come in. Yeah. It, I have messages from parents where like they find my Instagram account and yeah. like snap out of a postpartum depression instantly because, you know, they don't have... You know, I'm not saying that's the cure for this part of depression, but a lot of people, you know, a lot of people find that they're like, I was paralyzed by mm-hmm. the amount of confusing information. There's so much profit driven information out there. And it's sort of this nebulous thing where they're like, oh, I know that the early years matter, but I don't know if anything I'm doing is actually going to be helping. Right. And so we can give parents nurture as their North star in these year in these early years they really like so much of the worry drops away. So many of the things that don't last forever can be ignored. And the things that do last forever can. can yeah. Yeah. You talk a lot about really the simple things like presence, your voice. I love the way that you explain how skin to skin is important because it's all the things that we naturally have, don't we? And it doesn't cost anything. It's just really nice bringing it back to to basics, really, for for parents stripping it back to, as you say, sometimes we've lost our intuition. Maybe I don't know. Doctor Google was taken over. <laughs> yeah, and so much of this, like, yeah, so many, you know, businesses and pressures. Like, you have to do, have like a perfect looking playroom or a perfect organic home prepared food or the perfect amount of baby classes and all that stuff is nice if you have 
headspace for it, but it's all extra. Like it's none of that stuff is needed for babies to thrive. Yeah. Yeah. And there is that connection piece, isn't it? And we were talking earlier about swimming in and bringing it to the, that nurture into the pool, because there are obviously like parenting different styles of teaching and different styles of programs, but bringing it back to as you say the nurture and the connection is so important and you know maybe we don't realize how memories are formed and how first impressions are almost sort of the body felt really it's almost a somatic experience isn't it because we were talking about your 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 first water experiences which were you know maybe it's not as gentle but I love when you're explaining how you know you're still a water person which is which is really nice yeah when you said it I did just get really tense in my body like really aware of that I held my breath I got really yeah as a baby the swimming lessons I had they they would dunk I didn't want to put my face in and the teacher dunked me without my permission and I do yeah I'm still feeling that tension right that's yeah, that was not a good experience for me. And my parents continued to bring me, I would get shut down, I would scream, I didn't want to go. I, I, I'm guessing they didn't dunk me again <laughs> after that, because I kept going. And I did end up, you know, swimming every single week of my life and became an instructor and lifeguard and love swimming still do with my son, but I did not I am not dunking him. He chose to put his face in himself. And I like that you bring up memory, right? I think it's similar to a lot of the experiences our babies need to have, where they just need safe, accompanied experiences in those infant years to really, you know, build that safety later. I think parents are so worried, you know, with swimming lessons and dunking babies and all this, you know, some of the harsher kind of lessons, they're so worried, oh, I have to teach swimming now, you know, in order for them to have a good relationship with the water and learn how to swim so early. And, you know, I think it, it, you know, my choice with my son and I, you know, I think is a great choice is to just make it a happy, mm-hmm. playful, fun experience of connection. And so they kind of grow up with those memories. Yeah, and definitely. Fun. Definitely. Yeah. Cause I mean, to actually learn how to swim it takes time you can't rush the process it's a process that will happen when we're learning really and when we're 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 ready to learn and I think it's just really as you say when you mention in force and dunking that the brain just shuts down doesn't it a stressed brain can't learn so it is about that gentle time together and playing learning through play and just building building it up so we can't really rush the process as much as we <laughs> we, we we try definitely sure. so when for any parent that that has experienced because moments in their life when their babies cry because I think you know it is very natural isn't it we, we can say that that's the baby expressing themselves it's it's important that they have that as a communication but it's really different isn't it when we're ignoring those cries or we're not actually applying a response a nurturing response and that could happen with any type of training whether it's sort of sleep training at home or sort of forceful swim training but what happens in terms of the brain when a baby is left stressed or left crying and it's a continuous repetitive process yeah it's a really good question I mean I think we've you've already mentioned one a very important part of it is that babies cannot learn Mm. when they're stressed neither can we as adults nobody can learn when they're stressed a stress state is a survival state. Mm. And, you know, babies actually don't have the brain parts working to take themselves on their own without co-regulation from us from a state of high stress to low stress. Mm. And this is one of the most important things for parents to learn because there is so much misinformation out there about it, right? Leave them to cry. They need to build their ability to self-soothe or self-regulate again meaning going from high state high state of stress to a low state of stress that's completely false completely false babies learn to go from states of high stress to low stress alone through thousands of times of us supporting their stress and so so babies are not learning you know in states of stress they're surviving 
and they're, you know, they're surviving and communicating for help to have that stress lowered. It's extremely uncomfortable for babies to be experiencing high levels of stress and signaling for us through crying mm. and having no response. It's, it's almost intolerable and it does get intolerable if it goes on for long periods of time or repeated over many, many days. And so, so if that does happen, the body goes from a fight or flight state of stress where the baby would be crying, thrashing around, signaling, help me, help me into a freeze state of stress, which is an even more extreme level of stress where they're dissociating from that pain because it's so painful to be experiencing it without help, you know, into shutting down, withdrawing, and and sometimes even falling asleep as a, as a coping mechanism. Yeah, yeah. We do sometimes see that swim programs can be quite overstimulating and we can celebrate at the end like, oh, you know, baby's fallen asleep. I think we've got to just be really cautious. Has baby received nurture care and they're really just loving the water or has it been just so stimulating that they had no chance, no other option really than just to, to as you say, sort of shut down and, and to, to fall asleep. And it's mm. just understanding, isn't it, as parents and as educators that, you know, what the differences are really for our babies. Yeah. So, and so. it's so important to be able to watch your baby and really understand that because free, I didn't, yeah, I didn't quite get that freeze response until yeah. I was doing a lot more infant mental health training. Yeah. And you know, a fro a baby in freeze and a baby who's ha- like happy or a good baby, right? Like that might look the same, right? Quiet, staring, mm-hmm. you know, not moving a lot is probably more of a freeze state, mm-hmm. sleeping, passing out into sleep in a way that maybe they wouldn't normally just kind of like yeah. put them down yeah. versus like a baby who is content, who would probably be interacting with their like the people around them, toys, right? That kind of thing. They're both sort of quiet, but they're they're not, you know, the same brain state. Yeah, definitely. It's almost like what, it's the bigger picture, isn't it? And the whole cluster of cues of what has happened before, really, for baby and to take it, take it all in. So yeah, it's it's nice because there are different programs out there in our water world that can push towards uh, the quick, harsh methods and babies are definitely stressed and crying. And, mm. you know, sometimes that's celebrated like a great thing because they're learning fast and they're learning to float, but it, it's just not good for, for baby at all. And it's not nurturing them, which is what obviously we're here. And that's what our passions are. Absolutely. Yeah, my son being listening to him and doing a lot of a lot of time in the pool every mm-hmm. summer and throughout the year he hasn't been ready to put his face in mm-hmm. do front floats and back floats start doing doggy paddle and he's almost five he just you know this was the first this yeah. winter was the first time he was comfortable doing any of those things and he is so confident now he wants yeah. to like jump in he wants yeah, to no. practice his floats and you know just listening to him it took five almost you know four and a half years yeah for him to be comfortable with that and that's okay yeah Yeah. perfect Perfect. in your book you have got lots of myth busters god I think there's over 20 so far when I was reading but Mm -hmm. let's have a look as a few together because I think they're so good and I love again your socials the way you just break it down and it's really really easy and everything the first one is infants don't remember anything Mm-hmm. Yeah, such a big one. People, you know, if yeah. parents are concerned, like, oh, you know, the swim lesson, the, my baby seems really stressed in the swim lesson or really stressed during the sleep protocol we're doing or a behavior timeout, you know, something, you know, people will say, you know what, if your gut is making you feel bad about it, like make you feel it's bad, don't worry, they won't remember anything. Yeah, like, it doesn't matter. Except you are trying to make them remember something because you're probably trying to teach them something through that cry. Anyway, that also kind of doesn't yeah. add up. But the truth is there's many forms of memory. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think when people say this, they're talking about autobiographical memory, the who, what, where, when memories. And even just to take my example of being dunked as yeah. an example, right? I don't remember what my teacher looked like. I don't remember anything they said. I don't remember 
anything about that day, but I do remember the feeling in my body. Yeah. Of of that happening, right? And and probably because my parents have told me the story, I remember a few more details about it. Yeah. You know, so we don't, it's true, we do not have autobiographical memories mostly in those first three to four years of life. That's because what one of our memory centers is developing so rapidly that we actually don't recall autobiographical memory. That's the hippocampus. But we have motor memory, sensory memory, and emotional memory, yeah. which is what I focus on quite a bit, right? And so those are all kind of stored in our bodies and, and other parts of our brain, not the autobiographical memory. So actually, go, let's go back to those 1 million connections per second. Wow. The brain is rapidly encoding memories in those first three years. We're going to remember you know, a huge, huge amount of our experiences, but we're not going to remember them. Like we can tell a story about them. Yeah, definitely. And sometimes it just takes one, I don't know, smell almost, isn't it? And it just can almost like transport you back and into that shock. You know, it could be a really strong smell of chlorine and you just think, ha, oh, hang on a minute. As you say, it takes your breath away, but it's just bring in and link in that into that sort of moment, really. Respond. And you know what? I had so many positive experiences. Yeah around swimming after that that yes. can kind of repair it so for any, anyone who's who's been doing yeah. any of these kinds of things yeah we can always go back to a gentle yeah approach to you know create new memories but those ones from the early days still are there right even yeah. with the yeah memories. definitely definitely yeah when we know better we can just do better and just you know, rewire and, and repair as much as we can, definitely, definitely through nurture. But some people, when they have babies and maybe they'll become a little bit fussy or crying and, and they, they just feel like responding to them is actually spoiling them. And mm. I remember growing up myself, it was like, you know, it was okay to be left in a pram because that was good. That was good for fresh air and to be left, you know, because if you you were attended to quite a lot, then, you know, you were spoiling them or you would, you'd create a fussy baby. I remember, yeah. I remember that being, being a, a parenting part. For sure. And it's, that is still going really strong now. It's, it's amazing to hear so many of our parents out there are hearing this mm. from their families, from their, from everyone they know and are embarrassed to be responding to their baby. But it's a total myth. It's a total myth responding to these cries with spoiling. It was created by, you know, these, these books written by male doctors who never birthed the baby, took care of a baby. They gave babies vaccines and like checked their physical health and somehow are making rules for parents about how much they can respond to their babies mental health and emotional well-being completely outdated I always try to help parents tune in to their intuition and their voice and so you know this happened to me with my son too right because this is so yeah. pervasive in culture like I remember being in places where he was crying and I was helping him in a really nurturing way and like felt a bit of shame like people were looking at me like oh she's soft like that you know he's probably crying because of her just these voices come into our heads because they're everywhere i know that's not true and so flipping that remembering like the the voice that is influencing those thoughts and the spoiling myth are you know some doctor who's long long gone who somehow had this huge impact on parenting I don't want that person to be influencing my parenting. Yeah. And then have my voice that's saying your baby's signaling to you, you know, you're building his brain and helping his lifelong mental health by responding and it feels good and it feels right. And like, that's the voice I want to be listening to and responding to. So yeah. um, it's, it is a giant myth. And even, even though we know it, it's still, it's still out there. there. Yeah. yeah, yeah, no, I can, I can really resonate with that. And it definitely has an imprint of how we respond as adults, because I remember people saying, oh, you turned out okay, which I did, but actually sometimes over responding to say rejection or or not knowing if someone is going to be exactly there and, and, you know, you can sort of put it back to go, well, actually, you know, may, maybe being left <laughs> 
left to cry or sleep, you know, does leave little, little traces of how you respond later as an adult. So just getting to know yourself, isn't it? And as parents to myth bust now. So they're really understanding that they're there for their, their little ones. And then this really brings us really nicely on to babies need to learn how to self-soothe. <laughs> it's this is like the biggest one that needs to come down mm. right we talked about it a little bit before babies have the brain parts to become alarmed perceive threats and launch a stress response into their body mm. it's also important to know what is a threat to a baby because we kind of classify that for them and just respond to certain cries and not other cries so if we know sometimes parents are like, well, if I know if I they've hurt themselves, of course, I'm going to hug them and help them feel calm again. But if they're crying for what I would say is like an invalid reason, like they want a different cup or like they don't like the shape of their sandwich or something, I, no, I'm not going to, they can self-soothe for that because, yeah. you know, I don't, I don't like that one. Yeah. Um, and the truth is we do need to be fully accepting of whatever emotions and stress they have and be there just to help them co-regulate so no self-soothing all co-regulation for babies they can't do it they really can't do it what they will do is figure out an adaptive way to have co-regulation yeah you know even you know they'll get around it because they absolutely need it regardless yeah. of how we yeah in your respond. book you say that they have to borrow borrow their parents systems because you know they're not set up to regulate self-regulate completely on their own and they are borrowing us so it is that partnership approach isn't it and babies parents are their sort of safe harbor so I love I love the way that you say Absolutely. and it's, it's hard it's demanding they have lots of emotions yeah. we're not going to do it perfectly every time at all but we can really really try our best with this information to know knowing it's also a season you know it's about three years they still will need us as children and I think a lot of us want to parent you know through our child's life we they want we want them to come to us with their big feelings and that does start in infancy yeah definitely definitely babies are resilient so experiences in infancy don't really matter again that brings us and links us into emotions don't we so you know we just awesome. feel that they can just do it on their own it's okay it's such a big one right like the, the, they're resilient they're okay like we can do they can do they can have long times of crying alone they can you know be punished they can you know be spanked right like all these things they're they're resilient they'll bounce back and it's really really not true these infant experiences do really matter they do impact our minds and our brains and and you know of course we all have some resilience meaning you know we can overcome challenging situations but resilience is built in infancy the mechanisms that give us resilience are built by being really responsive and and kind and empathetic to babies in infancy and so if resilience is something you want for your child nurturing them in these in these early years is is key it's really, really key. It also goes back to like what you brought up is like, you know, I was punished and mm. trained and, you know, and I'm fine. And I really like to question that because I don't think we're fine. I think we're in an, an unbelievably enormous mental health epidemic mm. where we're all dealing with anxiety and depression and sometimes even, you know, larger mental health struggles we're having, we're all lonely, we have problems with relationships, we all have problems with sleep, we're extremely unhealthy emotionally. And so I don't think that's fine. Like, I think that's you survived your infancy and childhood, but I don't think we're fine. No, no, we're not, we're not thriving. It's just life's almost got too complicated. And I don't know if you feel the same, but the pandemic, especially in the UK, sort of just opened up and it almost like just sped things up. So we're already going down this road, but now it just feels like we're on the highway or the motorway. And quite frankly, I want to get back to the country roads. <laughs> completely, completely. Yeah. And I think that's, that's it. I think we have all probably, myself included, my friends and family 
we have all not had a completely nurturing infancy or nurturing at all in some cases. And we have a chance to make a different future mm-hmm. for the next generation now. So, so there's that, that's the hopeful part. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. No, that's great. That should be like captioned, you know, that, that is that, that just brings us all the way around to why, why we're doing it and why it's really important to get the information out. I'd love to signpost our listeners to your book and your socials as well, because there's so much really, really valuable information that we can all share, whatever, you know, obviously I'm from the aquatic world, but it's so relevant to to really release the information, as I say, and and share. Where can we find your great work and follow you and get involved? Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So my Instagram account is Nurture Neuroscience Parenting. Yeah. And I share all the offerings I have there. I have one-on-one sessions. I'm offering workshops a series of workshops coming up and links to my book are also there through my Instagram. Also links to my website, which is nurtureneuroscience.com. Nice. Perfect. And what I'll do is I'll pop all the links underneath so it can sign posts back to you and uh, yeah, be part of of this revolution together, really, because as I say, Ah, in the world, one baby at a time. (laughs) Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Aqua Sensory Way. It's so nice to have you here tuning in today. Let's connect again soon. I'd love you to find out more about creating sensory harmony in water. Come and join us on our socials and in our community Facebook group, Aqua Sensory Connections.